you know, have like a little smiley face. Yeah, exactly. The the animated version format. Well, hey guys, welcome to this this joint. I'm going to call it a joint business of architecture and Archispeak broadcast because really, I have the questions. You guys have the answers and plenty of opinions. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. <Probably. laughs> so, you know, I just recently posted an interview that's going to go live. Um, when we're recording this interview, well, it's an interview I did a while ago with um, an intern architect named Pat Flynn. And I don't know if you guys have heard of Pat or what he's done, his story. But in 2008, uh, Pat was laid off from his uh, firm, just like I was. I was laid off in 2008 down in Panama. Pat was laid off uh, from his firm, and he was about to get married, you know, about to get an apartment together with his girlfriend. And so, like others who went through that, it was devastating. You know, and I know we all experienced that to some degree. We saw our friends and people we cared about or ourselves going through that difficult transition. But what's interesting about Pat is what happened is he actually, um, he had this blog going on where he was teaching architects. Well, actually, he was just um, posting his own thoughts about the lead AP exam. And unbeknownst to him, he had a huge following. So when he quit his job, he started getting into, like, online marketing. And within a month... Um, he figured out that he could start making money from his blog. And the first year after he was laid off, he made um, over six figures. And now he's making roughly fifty dollars to $60,000 a month. Wow. Wow. And so you guys, you know, feel free to watch that and read up on his story. Because what I think that tells us, and this is just a preface to our conversation, but that um, there's a lot of money to be made on the Internet and I don't say in a way of like, let's be scammy and let's go out there and make money on the internet. What I mean is that there's a lot of business transactions that are happening. You know, people are spending more time there. And so then that's one thing I think you guys are really um, modeling is being there in that space, getting visibility. And so what I'd like to talk about today is the insights you guys have picked up about how other architects, small firms, or solo architects, because I really feel that right now solo architects are sort of under attack because of the changing business environment. So if we can figure out how to leverage web tools to get more exposure, get more clients, there's there's something where we can all gain from that. Well, I think uh, his example is another uh, another way that architects uh, can use their education to do other things other than than the traditional architecture course. You bet. So let's, let's, before we get into the questions, let, tell us about Archerspeak. There are some people probably going to find this. They don't know me from Boo, and they might not know you guys either. So just give us a short little snippet of what you guys are, and who wants to be the mouthpiece? Neil. Me? All right. Um, Archerspeak. Um, you know, it's a podcast um, that was... I think envisioned originally just as, you know, the three of us getting together and as if you'd kind of walked by the water cooler in the office and there was a conversation going. And just to kind of um, share our, our own ideas or opinions about the, the profession and architecture in general and sometimes, you know, not architecture, off topic as, as well. So really just the three of us hanging out, talking um, that you might, find a conversation happening in, in an office. And, and I think that's really the, the goal. What's your goal? Yeah, what's your goal? What do you, I mean, I know you guys aren't, I, I get the impression you guys aren't in it for any, for yourselves particularly, but you sort of have a grander, grander idea that you're pursuing. Well, yeah, I, I would say that our, our goal is to share, you know, and just give people kind of a look behind the curtain. That's really yeah. all, it, that's all how, why we started it, was because and I think, I, I, you know, when, when I was in school, I wished that there was something like this where we could kind of get a glimpse as to what really happens. And the nice thing about us being in three different scenarios and three different parts of the country is that there's a pretty broad range of experiences there. And so it, it's kind of a, a really rounded look at what it's like to be working for yourself, working for a small firm, and working for a medium-sized firm. Um, you know, I think that... That's great insight to be able to have that and really, if not make a decision based on that, at least just have a glimpse and see what's going on out there um, and the, the things that we deal with on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah. And also, um, if I can just add to that, um, 
one of the things that seems like it's been evolving since we started this is almost a it's almost like a you know an online advice column for a lot of uh, new um, you know interns students uh, you know younger um, younger architects and even older architects that you know have kind of felt in you know experienced the same pain that we've you know had um, We've got a lot of uh, interns in my office that actually do listen to the podcast, and they, you know, it's like, oh, I, you know, I really wish somebody would have said that when we were in school, you know. And so there's a lot of, in, and there seems to be a theme that we have uh, going on in a lot of the comments that we get are, you know, these are things that they don't really teach us in school, but are really valuable um, as, you know, things that are part of the future of our profession or or this is what I'm going to be experiencing when I get out of school and no one's telling us that so I'm really glad that you're doing that you know kind of exposing what we're going to be doing you know and and I think we've all you know as we've talked about it in our podcast you know architectural education seems to be limited on what they really teach people when it comes to um, you know what the profession's really going to be giving them. You know they kind of keep them in the bubble. They should you know kind of live within that you know um, design and you know the idealized world, and then you know poof, just throw you out into the you know out into the wolves, and oh, it, it, it's a complete it's a it's a rude awakening sometimes. Yeah, and that's kind of what we you know kind of try to help dispel, is that it may be tough, but it's also amazing. Great. Well, and I think that the point you make about you guys, the variety of the makeup of the Archer Speak crew. So we have Neil, who's a sole practitioner. We have Evan, who works for a large firm that does schools and civic work. And then Cormac, you're with you're the one with the medium sized firm. Is that right? I'm in the medium sized firm, and we also do a lot of uh, civic work, um, K through 12. Uh, yeah, you know that kind of stuff, recreational work as well. Do a lot of similar work as what Evan does, but just probably um, it just, uh, single office, smaller firm, firm of uh, 22 people. Okay, great. Well, one thing I'd like to sort of touch on, going with the idea of spreading of information, because I think what you you guys hit upon a, a really interesting point that the information you're putting out there is going to give the architects who are following in our footsteps a lot more information than we had at their age, at least regarding the profession. So, and I think we've only started to tap what the internet can really do for connecting people and, you know, doing business and helping people add value to each other. So, let's just jump in really quick and, and let's start with Neil. Neil, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your experience with the internet and how it's changed maybe your profession as an architect in terms of just take it from there. Sure. Um, you know, I think when I first, uh, I mean, when we first started experiencing the Internet, I think in general the firm that saw it that I was working for at the time and myself saw it as a way to gather information. Um, it, I mean, suddenly, uh, say like a suites catalog or product information was much more readily accessible. And that's kind of maybe the first step. Uh, and then I think... Uh, later on it was, oh, you know, instead of saying printing a set of drawings, uh, you know, we could just upload it to an FTP server and our clients can download it. And there were issues involved with that, of course, all the time. And, and, but those are less nowadays. And even early days, internet or, or just email. It was like, wow, I can, I can email my clients instead of just calling them all the time or missing calls or, you know, making communication between your clients and yourself much more readily available. Uh, and I think that, that changed the whole uh, face of the way architects interact with our clients and our consultants as well. And I think, you know, later on, now we're kind of in this social media era of the Internet where, you know, you can have your, your Twitter account, your Facebook page, uh, Google Plus pages, and um, it gets you out quite a bit more than, uh, than was possible before. I think mean, before, you know, architects had a web page, and that may be your public, uh, public place that, that clients could get information about you, your, your online brochure. But I think um, web pages, uh, 
and uh, with the addition of the blogs and other social media, now you can have a conversation with not only your clients but other architects. So I really think this the social media era that we're in as far as the internet is allowing uh, a much larger uh, uh, voice and global scope to all architects. I mean, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I'm talking and have met other architects from you know all around the world essentially now. And that necessarily hasn't turned into, hey, I'm going to get you know have my next job, um, but uh, but that does. Uh, expand your reach and through uh, your own blog or uh, or through a blog you can share information um, and and share information with with potential clients or with other architects okay and so I think that's been very exciting so let, let's let's open it up and just I'm, I'm gonna pose a question to each three of you and just try and kind of brainstorm in what ways can architects maybe sole practitioners or small firms and even large firms Evan um, use the internet to build relationships that will bring in more work, that will redefine what we do, add value to um, the profession, basically market ourselves better. Well, what I, avenues we, are, are best for that? We just talked about this in, in our, our last podcast, I believe it was episode nine, where we talked about um, sharing and, and kind of like what we're doing on Arcaspeak, which is just showing people what we do. Um, and I made the analogy on there that you know, I, I believe architects should be a lot more like chefs and like you're watching the Food Network where they're not afraid to give away their recipes and show people how they do what they do. I don't think that people are out there looking to take that, but for the same reason people watch reality TV, they just want to see into somebody else's world because it is interesting. And what we do is extremely complicated and I don't think people get that at all. I think people watch some of these reality shows like Trading Spaces used to be one of them where you know we can redesign this place over a weekend and and therefore it's easy right um, but you know you're looking on a small TV and you're 30 feet away from that paint job because you know that that looks like crap in real life and uh, what we do is complicated and then there are so much coordination that happens between all of these different consultants and contracting and the, the client, the owner. Um, we have so much that we could share there and so I feel like the best way for people to get an audience or to get more people, get more eyeballs looking at them is to share that kind of stuff and so you know that's what I do on my websites that's what I encourage other architects to do as well there's so much knowledge people aren't looking to uh, to take it they're looking to find somebody to trust and yeah. uh, and well, I, I think that's a big deal Evan you have a very interesting website called get method yeah and I'd like to for you to give it a specific example so those people who may not they may want something more concrete about this sharing of content can you give me a specific example of how this would work to help the layperson understand what we're talking about? Yeah, well, for, on getmethod.com, I share video tutorials on how to use the software that I use every single day when I'm designing buildings. And so, if I can, and, and my target audience is not layman, if they want to watch, that's totally fine. My target audience is architectural designers. And so, again, I'm just giving away knowledge that I've gained by trial and error myself and things that I've picked up. I do the same thing in my studio at work with with the other interns who come in and work. You know, I I love to give tips and I love to teach people this stuff because it makes them better. And my goal is that we have better architecture in the world. Um, there is very small percentage of all of the buildings that are built are well done. And so if I can do anything about that to make it better, where people can get up to speed faster, hit the ground running. Um, you know, I'm all for it. I think that that's what we should be doing. And so everybody has their expertise. You should be sharing it. Awesome, awesome. Cormac, what's your input on web tools and social media for spreading ideas and getting visibility? Well, um, the the thought of social media in a tool of marketing for architects, that's, that's growing now. And I, I, I honestly haven't been able to wrap my mind around the best way of using that um, where it you know translates to more business for our firm you know we our particular firm has you know been established for 50 years and they've got you know good you know 
name recognition. And that's still, we're kind of under the old traditional method of, you know, handshake and, you know, uh, getting our projects that way. But when it comes to um, how I see it and view it as professional development, it's become an extraordinarily invaluable tool. I mean, I wouldn't have met these two guys that, you know, were on this adventure of the Arca Speak podcast without Twitter. I mean, we met on Twitter, you know, uh, Neil happened to come to the uh, AIA National Convention last year in D.C. We hung out for a week and, you know, he started talking about these ideas about the podcast and stuff. And what the podcast has done is let me see, you know, and, and in social media as in general, as seeing that there are other architects out there that have valuable information that can make, as, as Evan said, can make better architecture. And that's what we're all here to do. And that's what we all want to do is make good architecture. Um, and, you know, in, and I think the sharing, the open sharing of ideas, um, you know, the, the outreach, the, the just, you know, you know, looking at the web page is not simply as a um, business card, but also as a, you know, um, a way to look and find other good work out there, you know, to kind of inspire. You know, I, I use a lot of this more as, you know, kind of like my own little inspiration to kind of keep me moving um, in the right direction forward. Okay. Well, so one thing about, if we're talking about, let's talk about websites a little bit, because one thing, if I can give a suggestion about my observation, it seems that websites are such a rich format. You know, now, even, even five years ago, websites were mostly static pictures and text. Yeah. Now you have video, you have, you can leave comments, so you can interact. So they're really turning into like this rich platform. And I know that a lot of that deals with specifically with social media, so Neil, I just wanted to ask you, you recently redesigned your website and you're involved, you have some social media on your site. What advice could you give to small practitioners out there that may not have a website or thinking about doing that, about what you've learned from getting your stuff online? Sure. Um, have good photos uh, <laughs> is one thing. And, um, you know, find a, find a platform to, to use that uh, makes, makes your life easier. Uh, I know when, when we publish, um, even on ArchiSpeak, because my site and ArchiSpeak's website are, are hosted on Squarespace, and that platform makes it very easy to share um, when there's updates to multiple locations, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, to Facebook, and so on. So uh, that makes it my life a little bit easier so that um, I don't have to work as hard. Um, I'd also suggest that, um, or, or just point out that, getting out there and doing that is a lot of work. And so in addition to your day job, uh, just finding clients and interacting and designing and producing construction documents that, um, you know, making, making sure that your voice is heard is, it does tend to be a lot of work. And so there's, you know, nights or uh, early, early mornings where I'll get up and, you know, uh, pub, you know push out tweets or schedule tweets um, and things of that nature, or write about uh, different topics. So those are the times that those things typically happen. And so that it does, you have to work at it. It's not something you can just put a page up and forget about it, and it becomes a ghost town. Uh, I think adding a blog to my site has helped drive a lot of eyeballs to it. Uh, there's more I can do with it, more I have planned to do with it, but as of right now, um, you know, it's getting my name out there a little bit more. Yeah. So, um, real quick, Neil, if there's two, if there's an architect who's starting a site and he has to choose between, or he or she has to choose between two different social media platforms, which ones would you say the ones they want to be on first? Well, I tell you, um, it's an interesting, it's a great question. You know, there's, I have to say, I think Facebook is one place that if you're going to start a page, you know, for your, for your business, be on Facebook. You know, they've got almost 100 million eyeballs looking at that site uh, virtually every every day or every month. And that's where there's there's a lot of people. Twitter, there's it's another beast, but there's a lot of action happening on Twitter as well. And ironically enough, um, I didn't really think much of LinkedIn before or even Google+. Plus. I mean, they have a, a far smaller audience. Um, but what I've found is that a lot of uh, referrals to my site 
or commenters even on my site come from LinkedIn and Google Plus. I, I have really been surprised. They have uh, very dedicated communities on LinkedIn, for instance, uh, that uh, you know you can post in in groups uh, or join groups, and uh, very dedicated. And they they really there's a lot of traffic that comes from those sites, and I, that actually kind of surprised me. Interesting. Well, let's just a follow up question to that. Let's talk about. Tra there's traffic and then there's traffic that's ready to buy or at least one of your clients that is ready to buy your services. So I noticed you didn't mention House, but that's one of them. Um, right. which, which out of the five there you mentioned, let's pick two, purely for leads to get work. I think leads to get work you're looking at um, oh, uh, probably Facebook and House as well. Uh, Facebook is, is helpful because there's just so many people. Every, everyday people are on Facebook. And they're going to see that. Maybe everyday people aren't on LinkedIn. Um, and then um, House, I, I didn't mention that before, but yes, that, that's an excellent site. And actually, I do have some clients uh, just recently that sent me their idea book. Um, as one of the things I typically tell clients when I first meet them is always clip out pictures or send, you know, save photographs of ideas that, you know, you have for your thinking, that you're thinking of for your design. And now House has almost become this, this perfect magazine, if you will, for an unlimited supply of photo photography and that can be very uh, easily searched uh, for very specific spaces. And so it's a great resource and I highly recommend it to my clients uh, to go and search that. And I, I haven't seen a lot of traffic come from uh, House, but, um, but it, is, it is helpful to have a presence there as well because there's a lot of homeowners that see that site. Yeah. Now if I can ma make a suggestion also, House.com actually, I read something recently that, and I've come to this conclusion that it's a good way, it actually helps you educate your clients in the value of design. And that's yes. this, this is, I was talking with someone who, who works over there at House and she was telling me that this is actually an unexpected um, thing that happened when, with House, and that's H-O-U-Z-Z.com, is that people, when they're on that, like if you're an architect and you send people there, to browse for photos that they want to basically model their, their project on, then their taste actually changed. They found that people that frequent house, they actually start liking contemporary architecture. There's a lot of that on house, so I'm not surprised. Yeah, I, when I yeah. was doing design build with a partner, we had a client who had a beautiful post and beam, mid-century modern bones of a house that had been kind of modified over time. and when they came to us, they had a set of drawings from Bob's Drafting Service, which is a real drafting service, and they were basically going to turn it into a stucco tracked house. And oh. all we did was start feeding them Dwell Magazine, and this was years ago, but you know, when Dwell first came out and it wasn't packed full of ads, it, was, it, w it showed some really nice projects, and you know, obviously it still does. But um, it totally changed their mind. It was the thing where they started to see the quality of light and the indoor outdoor spaces that that modern architecture kind of triumphs and we ended up doing that for them and and it was all because of looking at those pictures and so it's the same thing it's just online now yeah okay well I wanna, let's jump over to the offline world really really quick and I'm gonna target a question at you Cormac and at, at Evan I know you guys are involved in presentations and meeting with clients and that part of the the process I know you are, Evan. I'm not sure exactly, Cormac, your specific function, because um, I know there's a lot of different roles in the firm. But Because our firm is a smaller firm, <laughs> um, project managers are pretty much the you know, soup to nuts kind of uh, project managers, all, you know, all hands on deck. We um, lead, the, you know, uh, lead everything from the feasibility studies all the way through construction administration. Um, I particularly am, I don't think I could possibly function in this profession if I wasn't hands-on every day. And so um, nine-tenths of the pr um, documents that, you know, I present, or at least recently have been presenting are created by my hand. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in there. Okay, good to know. So the question I have then is what, let, let's take it from, you're, you're giving a presentation and the client sitting there, we've all been to these meetings where there's an RFP that's been issued, they're interviewing five architecture firms, you show up, you're part of the interview committee, and so I wanted to ask 
all three of you for your input on what things have you seen effective for how to carry those out because I know a lot of times they're intimidating it feels like it's a, a dog and pony show well, well my, my first thing that I would say is the most successful presentations that we've given are um, the ones where we just show how well we work together as a team and if if the client who's there who's interviewing you and they're looking at three or five different firms in that day or over a couple days they're tired if there's any way that you can engage them and uh, and just show how well your team works together I found that to be a huge bonus for for them because if they get any sense that that the people who are interviewing together number one aren't going to be working on their project um, and then number two that that there's some something between a couple of people that doesn't seem quite right they're they're very dismissive of that kind of behavior I think I definitely agree with Evan um, you know a lot of times it, it definitely comes down to team chemistry I mean you can walk in there with a great you know PowerPoint slideshow or um, you know good 3d renderings of things and some you know boards and stuff like that that you know kind of show the quality of work you can do but they want to know the quality of the person they want to know the quality of the team and you know pretty pictures are, are great but pretty teams are better yeah well yeah they're gonna be working with you for years most likely I mean and, and so you've got to fit well with them on top of you know being a good team what, what that you bring what in there. What have you guys seen about how do you demonstrate that cohesiveness as a team how would you get that across? Well I think it's gotta be legitimate and you have to already have the experience of working together quite a bit because I think probably the easiest way to show that is when you fi you finish each other's sentences mid stride because you're so used to working with each other and you know what uh, the other people think and you you know their sensibilities um, it's got to be real or else it's it's not going to work yeah that you know I totally agree um, but also you know being able to when you outline um, you know a lot of times we'll go in and we'll say you know the, a lot of them will ask us you know about our process and to be able to have the entire team basically explain and outline their role in the process and how they're going to fit and you know how, how that seamlessly works between all of the different people um, you know it shows the client that you know they're you've assembled a competent team and that they're getting a competent team Neil, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I would say um, that this also works on a small scale um, so that you have to create that sort of relationship with the, with the potential client. And you, um, you have to go in there and be friendly, show that you know what you're doing, and uh, be professional, but you know, be, act friendly. Because even though this may not be a school project, um, that I may be working on uh, that last several years, uh, like my uh, like my co-hosts do. But you know, even with with a remodel, you're going to be involved with these people pretty heavily for maybe six months to a year. And you know, I do a lot of work uh, in my neighborhood uh, around town, and so you're going to see those people as well. So you want to have a as a good relationship, and uh, and I think that's that's one way that you know you can. Um, if you're friendly and, you, and it's genuine and you're not just trying to scam somebody uh, to get a job, then that works. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's, let's talk about the visibility factor of the Internet because when there's just so many ways, so many things that can be done. You know, you see people going viral all the time, and I'm a big believer that each of us individually, we're all so unique. I mean, we have the potential to go viral to maybe a certain limited number of people. So we can go viral within our own circles and that can help us achieve our own personal goals and going along with the I think the chef analogy Evan that you were talking about you know sharing and just giving 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 that information online I've seen to be effective from your guys's experience in because you guys are pretty deeply involved in social media and online tools you know can we brainstorm a couple ideas about how maybe three different kinds of architects could benefit 
from the online space. Let's take, for instance, a sole practitioner, what's well, something they could do. Um, let's think about uh, a middle management person at a mid-sized firm that wants to reach out and connect with people in their niche. And I don't have a third person. Maybe you guys can think of someone. Well, Cormac, you, you've also been a sole practitioner as well, but uh, yeah. I think from my perspective, the uh, just just getting out there and being in, in the public actually helps that. And then to have that online presence is what your clients or potential clients are going to see and hear after you leave their house and, uh, you know, or leave I'm their... I'm going to ask a follow-up uh, question. Yeah, go ahead. So let me, I, I just want to interject, Neil. Um, when you say get out there in the public, you know, um, what what venues have you found to be most effective for connecting with the kind of people that want to do business with you? Because, I mean, going out in the public, you know, let's be a little bit more specific about that for the people that may be wondering, you know, who do I talk to and who exactly should I go schmooze with? Sure. It, it, it's not easy. You have to get out uh, and involved in uh, local events. You'd say your chamber, your local uh, chamber or rotary clubs, a different uh, B&I potential events. Uh, and then also, too, if you've got a local AIA office, that may not help you gain clients, but it'll help you talk with other architects to find out about other venues. Um, home tours is another one. You can go see. Um, you know what other architects are doing for ideas and then you get a chance to actually meet them and talk to them and then you can also what's fun when you go on these home tours is you follow around other people and listen to what they're saying um, and you can gain a lot of valuable information by just uh, you know opening up your ears and listening to what other people are walking through these home tours are saying and thinking and that can give you some valuable insight to what you should or how you should maybe approach a potential client in the future yeah. I want to turn this to Cormac because you mentioned that Cormac was a sole practitioner for a while. Cormac, it was my understanding um, from what I've read, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you had your firm, but the work was just maybe it wasn't there and you ended up taking a full time job. Uh, I had a similar scenario in my own background. Um, it's made me believe that being a sole practitioner is, is pretty difficult. And Cormac, I'd like to get a little bit of insight on your story and what you learned from those years of being a sole practitioner. Well, um, well, that's a <laughs> get your handkerchiefs out. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the violin, I'm the <laughs> exactly. No, um, I I had worked for um, a couple of different firms early on, um, honing a lot of uh, my skills in commercial, and had always wanted to do residential. And I had um, some buddies of mine from college who. They wanted to basically kind of, you know, go out on our own. And so we did. And this was in 2005. The market was still good. And we had, you know, plenty of opportunity out there. We had, you know, some really good projects. Uh, we had some things, um, some involvement with the new urbanist movement. Um, and, you know, things, we were so kind of inter intertwined with both developments and residential that as that market started to dry up um, and I wanted to kind of fall back on commercial, you know, this is 2006, 2007, um, end of 2006, 2007, when we really started to feel things dry up. And um, everybody was going after the same projects. And we were in a smaller market in Florida at the, you know, I was still living in Florida at the time. And it just, they all went away. I mean, the people who had, you know, residential contracts, they got scared. They weren't sure about the market and the economy. So they just, you know, they pulled up stakes and ran. Um, so, you know, we, we looked at what our options were um, in the smaller market that we were at. And, um, you know, some friends took basically, you know, my former partners basically took jobs wherever they could find it. Um, I am so, I, I honestly, and, and, and I get this question, you know, when I do a lot of like school presentations and stuff to, to little kids, they always ask me, well, if you weren't doing architecture, what would you be doing? I don't know. <laughs> That's why I want to keep doing architecture. And so um, I, I started looking around and found that the DC market was, seemed to be um, insulated. Uh, there was a lot of uh, work going on up here and a lot of opportunity. So not knowing anybody, we 
you know, picked up stakes, moved away from family, and moved to D.C. Um, have had wonderful opportunities to do all sorts of um, interesting projects, historic preservation, uh, new projects, a lot of additions. And, you know, when I came in, you know, in I was the new guy, they were like, well, let's give him all the Band-Aid work. Um, so it was doing a lot of, like, you know, fixing, you know, pre-existing problems. Um, and, and so, you know, and that's kind of what led me to where I'm at now is kind of going back and, you know, I, I jokingly say working for the man, but no, it's, it's actually working for the opportunity to do, as we always say, good work, you know. I don't, I'm not quite sure what the, the follow-up to that one was, but that was the backstory. <laughs> that's, that's a good backstory. Well, I guess, do you guys, from what you're seeing, and I'm going to address this to Cormac and to Neil, uh, right, we're about to wrap up, but, you know, is it really sustainable to be a sole practitioner nowadays? Can, can it be done reasonably? And let's say, let's say with a sole wage earner, is it realistic to venture out? And is it sustainable? I would say from my experience, um, in, in, in Neil's is, is, is an interesting story in its, in its own right because, you know, he's, a, he's in a family of two architects one as a, a residential architect and one as a commercial architect. And, and so it's, it's, it's a really, <laughs> I actually admire Neil's story because, uh, you know, one architect is hard to live with, but, you know, two, wow. But, um, you know, honestly, um, soul practicing is hard, um, especially if you're, you know, in larger markets where there's a lot of people, you know, basically going after the same thing. But in smaller markets where you can do, as Neil was talking about, the personalized business, I think there's still very strong opportunities to do sole practitioner. Um, some of the most, you know, fantastic work that's been done throughout, you know, our, you know, short architectural history has been done by sole practitioners that use this as an opportunity to guide the clients um, in their vision, you know, not just, you know, be the, you know, kind of uh, button down stiff architect that, you know, people seem to, you know, think we all are and fear um, about that, you know, oh, I can't work with them because they're just going to tell me exactly what I want and, and they don't really work with me. No, I, I think sole practitioner is the ones who kind of break that mold and show everybody that, you know, hey, we're, um, you know, we're a family man too, we're, you know, we can work with you and listen to you and and really it, that's kind of you know uh, so yeah I'm, I'm gonna cut myself off but yeah I, I honestly think that that's um, that there still are opportunities for us I would say as Enoch you, as you found several of the people that you've interviewed that many of them um, have had success and some of that success has come from developing their own projects um, and so I think that is certainly an avenue, although some, you, know, you have to have some capital to do that or find some clever ways to get that capital to do that, and then there's a lot of risk involved. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I, would, I would have to say if you were going to, you know, if you had a family, if you were, let, me, let me rephrase that, if you were kind of on your own and you've got a little bit of savings, I think you can, you can try and make a go at it. Um, you don't have a lot to lose. If you've got a family and a mortgage, um, I'd say that's a pretty dangerous thing to do. A lot of us that are in the sole practitioner, um, you know, venue right now are doing it out of uh, no other choice. Um, there were no other jobs the last four or five years, and so we're trying to, you know, find and make a living. Um, you know, if, as Cormac said, my wife's also an architect. Um, She's been able to stay employed, um, and that's given us some benefits that, you know, I wouldn't have had, we wouldn't have had otherwise, um, and it's kept us in our home and, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, if you, if you are interested in getting out there, you know, listen to some of your previous podcasts about how some of the others, other people out there have done it, and then, you know, um, get out there and, and try it, but you really kind of need to have that safety net. Uh, to do so uh, because it's going to be tough and I think uh, I'm forgetting now who it was you might have interviewed um, but they you know it said that it took them several years before they started to become profitable and yeah, that's right. not uncommon in any business and it's not uncommon in, in architecture as well. 
Okay, great. Well, that's a great place to end it. And I just want to point out uh, my buddy Mark LePage over Entrepreneur Architect has resources also for small and solo practitioners to help them uh, run a better business. And now is basically the shameless plug part. So I just want to let everyone know, you know, on Business of Architecture, you can go to find information about how to launch a Facebook page, how to run ad campaigns, and all sorts of information about what's really effective for generating the kind of uh, clients that will help you automate sort of a sales system with the internet. And then let's switch over and give the plug for uh, Arches Speak, of course. And I love, man, I love listening to these guys. Their, their tagline here, they have wit and humor. Um, the tagline is, um, what is it? Arches Speak is made up words that make us uh, seem smarter than you are. Yeah. <laughs> Something, exactly. something like that. <laughs> I think that's that's on Twitter. That's your tag. And then at the beginning of every episode, they say something to the effect of, "Archer Speak is a show that dares to peek under the architectural kimono," which is, of course, uh, letting everyone know what really happens in architecture. So, yeah. gentlemen, tell us where can we find out more about Archer Speak and get dialed in to what you guys are doing there. Uh, probably the best way is on our website, arcaspeakpodcast.com, uh, and you can also find us uh, at Twitter or interact with us there um, at Arcaspeak, which is SP, uh, abbreviated SPK at the end. Uh, and then we also have a Facebook page, and we do encourage people to either use the website or the Facebook page to interact with us. Let us know what you're thinking, problems you're having, ideas uh, that you'd like to hear us talk about. Sure, and they can find you on iTunes, right? If they subscribe on iTunes, it'll be automatically downloaded to their phone. That's yes. right. And yes. you guys also, if someone has an Android phone, how do they get the podcast delivered? Uh, you can go right to our page, and you can download it on there, or you can also find us on Stitcher Radio now. That's one of the new things that we've come out on. So if you download that app, I think that's on Android and iPhone. Excellent. Well, just a little parting idea. The world is changing quick, but all four of us that you see right here we're here, we're here to venture our opinions out there and give as much information as we can. So That's right. Neil, Evan, and Cormac, um, thank you guys for what you do. Thanks for being on the show. And I'm sure this won't be the last time that we'll be able to have you guys on. Thanks for having right. us. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye.